Thank you all for attending the 18th annual William Barclay Parsons Technical Lecture sponsored by WSP. My name is Aaron Zekia. I'm a board member of the AAC Met Section Geo Institute, uh, and I'll be going through a few record keeping items first for the AAC Geo Institute before we begin. This year's lecture will be provided by Ray Costelli of WSP USA and is titled Current Topics in Excavation Support. The Met Section Geo Institute would like to thank our sponsor, the WSP USA. The William Barclay Parsons Lecture Series was, was first started in, in 2003 with the sponsorship of Parsons Brinkerhoff, now WSP. Um, it honors the ingenuity, resolve, and engineering achievements of General William Barclay Parsons and his contributions to the advancement of the field of underground engineering and infrastructure in New York City. William Barclay Parsons was the chief engineer of the New York Rapid Transit Commission that designed and, construct and constructed the first section of the New York City subway in 1904. This lecture series was intended, is intended to focus on the state-of-the-art topics in geotechnical engineering with a particular emphasis on tunneling and underground construction. Uh, so we'd like to thank our sponsor, WSP, uh, again. The next upcoming uh, event after this lecture is our 44th annual Met Section Geotechnical One Day Seminar. Uh, this, this event will be uh, held on Thursday, September 17, and it's located at Hotel, Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City. The registration form and the seminar agenda with a list of the speakers and the topics was sent out earlier this year, and we look forward to seeing many of you there. I'd like to thank the ASE Met Section Geo Institute Committee, who works hard to make these events happen. For any questions on future events, please feel free to reach out to the chair, Mike McNichols, or any of the members on the screen. After the lecture, we will have uh, the record of everyone that signed on and attended, and the PDH certificate will be sent via email. If you have any questions, please submit them on the right side of your screen, and we will read them out loud at the end of the presentation for the presenter to address. One more thing, if, if, you, uh, if you have coworkers who are, are, who are unable to attend, uh, note that the presentation will be recorded and shared with all the registrants after the lecture. Uh, we're honored to have Ray Costelli deliver this year's 18th annual William Barclay Parsons Lecture. For more than 40 years, Ray has served as a geotechnical engineer at WSP USA, formerly Parsons Brinkerhoff, in New York City, and is currently a senior vice president and the firm's technical director for geotechnical engineering. Ray currently serves as a technical advisor for high-speed rail projects in California and Texas, and the Second Avenue subway project in New York City, as well as the recently completed Eurasia Board Tunnel crossing of the Bosphorus in Istanbul, Turkey. He has authored more than 40 technical papers and is co-author of several FHWA geotechnical manuals. Ray is also the recipient of the 2020 ASCE Martin S. Cap Award. Thank you, Ray. And without further introduction, I will let Ray start the lecture. Thank you again. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and I would like to... Oops, we're having technical difficulties today. Now, I'd like to thank everyone for joining the lecture today. I hope you're all safe and healthy and uh, successfully coping with the extraordinary events of the last uh, two months. It's disappointing not being able to give the lecture in person, uh, but I'm glad that uh, we can at least do it electronically. Uh, one benefit of the presenting this lecture as a webinar is that it allows many more people to participate, including many from outside the New York City area. Over 500 have registered for the lecture, and I welcome all of you. I would like to uh, personally thank Frank Pepe of WSP for inviting me to give this lecture and to the Met Section Geotechnical Committee for their support. This is, this is truly a great honor for me. It is particularly special, uh, having worked uh, 43 years for the firm founded by William Barclay Parsons and which is now a part of WSP. I was very fortunate to have found my way to Parsons Brickerhoff early in my career and to have spent almost my entire professional life here, working on so many challenging and interesting projects. The firm has been a second home for me and, uh, and the countless colleagues I've worked with over the years have uh, truly been a second family. So today's 
lecture is uniquely special to me. But today is a special day for another reason. It just so happens that it's uh, Mr. Parsons' 161st birthday today. And uh, so next year when you're filing your income taxes on April 15th, uh, just uh, take a few seconds to remember and, uh, and honor uh, Mr. Parsons. This is a poster from uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff's 100th anniversary celebration in 1985. It's hung in my office to provide inspiration, but uh, having Mr. Parsons looking over my shoulder has been uh, also been somewhat daunting. Uh, and it's a bit discouraging to realize that uh, whatever personal success we may have will pale in comparison to the many notable accomplishments of this great engineer uh, and this great American. Mr. Parsons is a graduate of Columbia University School of Mines and uh, uh, in uh, 1885, at the age of 26, he founded his engineering firm in New York. Uh, he was an early proponent of a, a subway for New York City. And in 1894, he was named the chief engineer uh, of the Rapid Transit Commission in New York to study options and routes for the new subway. Um, as part of this, he took an extensive tour of Europe to uh, to witness the construction of some of the subway systems that were under construction there and to try to bring that uh, technology back to the U.S. to use on the uh, New York City subway system. But there was a, somewhat of a hiatus before the subway got, got going and in that time he, he kept busy. He was appointed trustee to Columbia University and during the Spanish-American War he was a chief engineer and a brigadier general of the New York National Guard. And in 1898 and 1899, he was over in China surveying a 900 mile long railroad route uh, starting in, of all places in Wuhan uh, and extending to uh, uh, Canton. That was one of the first uh, railroads uh, through uh, central China. And then in 1900 to 1904, he was chief engineer for the first New York City subway system. Uh, the contract one uh, included a total of 21 miles and 30 stations. 11 of those were uh, miles were cut and cover construction and four and a half miles were tunnel. Uh, Mr. Parsons could be credited for the innovation of the express rail service. In fact, today it's one of the only systems in the world that has express rail service. And uh, I, I always think of him when I take the, the express train up to Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. Uh, when constructed, the Civil Works cost about $35 million uh, at that time. Today, it's uh, my, my calculation uh, roughly puts it at $1.1 billion. Uh, after his assignment to the New York City subway, he was appointed by uh, President Theodore Roosevelt to the Panama Canal Commission to study options for, for building that canal. He was also chief engineer of the Cape Cod Canal uh, to uh, expedite the uh, 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 traffic between Boston and New York. And he also became trustee for the New York City Public Library and was elected uh, to as board chairman to Columbia University. So he had very many uh, civic activities during that period. When the U.S. joined the World War I, uh, Mr. Parsons volunteered in 1917 at the age of 58. And he eventually uh, rose to the rank of colonel and commanded an engineering regiment in France. And, and his U.S. unit uh, was one of the first to arrive, and it was attached to a French, to the French army, and was the uh, the f first U.S. unit to uh, be under or be in con uh, combat uh, in World War One. Uh, following the war, he was named brigadier general of the U.S. Army. And he also became a chairman of the board for the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center and was instrumental in the building of that uh, facility. Uh, in his life, uh, Mr. Parsons authored uh, four interesting books. So these are not uh, technical volumes. These are more historical volumes. I've got, had the opportunity to read a couple of them. And I found it especially interesting, the last one, Engineers and Engineering in the Renaissance. And this was actually published after his death. Uh, if you can uh, get a copy of this in a library or online, I, I highly recommend it. Very interesting to see how things, how monumental structures were built in the old days before 
modern uh, machinery and uh, modern engineering technology. Since the passing of Mr. Parsons, his legacy has been continued through the efforts and skills of thousands of professionals who have designed and managed, managed construction of some of the world's most iconic and important facilities. And this legacy continues today under the banner of WSP. And uh, working with the next generation of talented and dedicated professionals at WSP, many of whom are listening to the lecture today, I'm confident that his legacy is in very good hands and will continue long into the future. Uh, Parsons once wrote that of uh, all human activities, engineering is the one that enters most into our lives and permeates every fiber of the social fabric. Uh, and I think this is very true. Unfortunately, I, our efforts as engineers are rarely recognized by the public, but what we do touches the lives of virtually everyone and we should all be proud of the important contributions we make to society every day. Parsons also uh, wrote that it's not the design that governs, but it's adaptability to the economics and social needs of the time. And I think these words are true today as they were when he, uh, when he wrote them. Civil engineers will play a, a critical role in addressing current and future needs, including those related to global warming, uh, infrastructure for renewable forms of energy and for autonomous vehicles, uh, facilities to lessen the impact of future pandemics, which a few months ago we wouldn't have even thought of. And, and I'm sure there'll be other issues that uh, we as engineers will have to address, and we can't even imagine what they are at the present time. With that introduction, I'd, I'd like to get into the uh, presentation. Be talking uh, about several topics uh, I, th I think are, are worth talking about uh, based on recent experience. Uh, these include uh, the use of permanent uh, supportive excavation walls, the design and construction of these uh, walls, some of the considerations that go into that, uh, and uh, some thoughts on the performance of SOE systems, and finally a discussion of uh, buoyancy of underground structures, completed underground structures. So permanent SOE walls, how do we define them? Oh, these are walls designed to function both for intern, uh, for initial support of the excavation loads during the excavation and, and also serve as part of the final walls of the completed underground structure. Now as permanent uh, SOE walls, they may share some of the load with a, a let's say a cast in place interior structure. And the most common uh, uh, example of that is when the uh, SOE wall is designed for earth pressures but the interior cast in place concrete wall may be designed to support just the, uh, the water pressure. I think we've had good experience with the use of uh, permanent SOE walls. It's a mature uh, uh, technology, uh, over 50 years of, uh, of use. I remember one of my first projects was for a ventilation shaft for the Washington Metro system, and we used permanent uh, slurry walls for that shaft. And I thought it was a very economical way of, of construction, constructing it. It has a wide range of applications for highways, transit, buildings, and also water facilities. And major benefits, it, it obviously reduces the cost of construction, particularly if you can eliminate that cast in place inner structure and it reduces the right of way. And this is, this is all very important in uh, constrained uh, urban environments where we just don't have uh, enough right of way to, to construct both temporary supportive excavation as well as a permanent, separate permanent inner structure. And with that is a uh, reduced construction time. And, and uh, it's, it's notable that it's very suitable to top down construction. And this is useful when you're for buildings especially because the building can be going up as you're excavating uh, below ground for the underground uh, elements of the structure. Uh, one common type of uh, permanent wall is concrete diaphragm wall also called slurry walls and when we put in soldier piles uh, or uh, steel piles are called SPTC walls soldier pile and trimming concrete walls. On the Boston Central Artery, there was about six miles of slurry walls and totaled about uh, uh, 2.9 million square feet of walls. Uh, Second Avenue subway, uh, shown in the lower right, uh, it was used as a permanent wall in uh, phase one and it's being considered for phase two. 
And uh, for those uh, uh, who may not be aware, but if you go to the 9-11 uh, Museum in downtown Manhattan, you could actually see some of the uh, original slurry walls uh, and uh, foundations for the World Trade Center there. I highly recommend going there. It's it's uh, truly a very moving experience and, and, and a moving tribute to the, to the events of that day. And what are the advantages of slurry walls? Well, very high structural strength um, and very large wall stiffness, uh, which is useful if we want to protect uh, adjacent structures from damaging wall movements. In fact, sometimes that's identified as a key mitigation measure is to have a stiffer wall system. In comparison to uh, secant and tangent pile walls, they have fewer vertical joints and therefore uh, less prone theoretically to seepage. Uh, and uh, one advantage too is, is that's easier connection of uh, uh, roof slabs and invert slabs to the wall than, than might be possible with secant or uh, tangent pile walls. Some of the disadvantages, uh, it requires a larger area for the slurry plant and, and cage assembly. This could be a, a disadvantage uh, on, a, a, again, a crowded urban area. Uh, it requires more specialized equipment and construction methods than secant or, or tangent pile walls. Uh, and that's why in other parts of the, of the country, slurry walls are used less because it's easier to use local contractors that have uh, board pile experience for secant piles or tangent pile walls. And of course, there's risk of a groundwater seepage into the structure because many of these uh, structures do not have uh, a, a second interior structure for water tightness. And I think this is one of the issues that we have to address because uh, clients and engineers have some second thoughts about using um, permanent slurry walls because of this, this issue. The, uh, another type of uh, permanent wall is secant or tangent pile wall. Uh, and these could be reinforced either with uh, steel sections, as you see in the upper right, or with a conventional rebar cage. They could be provided with uh, different uh, facings, either cast in place or uh, shotcrete uh, or uh, precast. Uh, in the lower right, the Cleveland LRT, they like the look of those piles, and, and, and you can see them today. Uh, uh, I, I personally like them. I don't know if the public does, but uh, I, I seem to like them. Some of the advantages of, of uh, secant and tangent pile walls, they have good structural strength and stiffness, uh, uh, which is uh, good in many cases uh, uh, that you don't need slurry walls. Uh, it uses conventional board pile equipment and procedures. As I said, this is more, uh, maybe more commonly available in other parts of the country. And it's uh, well suited to constricted work sites. In fact, even on uh, Second Avenue subway, where they use slurry walls extensively, uh, some of the ancillary facilities, because of the tight uh, working areas, they used uh, secant piles. And uh, it's it's obviously more economical if if you only have a small excavation, because you avoid the uh, the cost of uh, mobilizing uh, all the uh, the equipment associated with uh, with slurry walls. Uh, some of the disadvantages, well, if you needed a high strength and stiffness, it's not as good as slurry wall. Uh, there's more vertical joints than slurry walls, so that could be a, a source of more seepage into the uh, permanent structure. Uh, and as I said before, it's a little bit more difficult to make slab connections to secant uh, pile or, or uh, uh, tangent pile walls. Uh, recently, uh, it's a very innovative tangent pile wall design was used in uh, San Francisco for the Muni subway. It's for the Union Square Market Street station. Uh, here, they had a very narrow right-of-way along uh, Market Street. It was only about a 68-foot, uh, maybe it was a 65-foot uh, um, right-of-way, and they had to squeeze the station into that. And down at the station level, they, uh, they had to have a, a wider uh, area to accommodate the minimum width of the platform as well as the TBM tunnels that, that pass through there. And at the surface, they had to have uh, uh, utility conduits on either side and also keep the, the sidewalks in, in operation during construction. So this led to an inclined tangent pile uh, system. Uh, inclined tangent piles uh, were four foot diameter uh, installed with uh, full length uh, 
temporary casing and with a, a rotor, rotator type of a piece of equipment. Um, and after the piles were installed and the casing extracted, uh, the outside of the of the walls, uh, they used uh, jet grouting to seal up any joints possible between those those piles. Uh, the uh, it had a uh, a cast in place inner lining and the inner lining uh, here, as, as I mentioned before, this one was, was designed uh, for water pressure and the external uh, tangent pile wall was uh, used to support the, the ground loads. Um, they had, the, the piles were installed at nine to 10 degree inclination and with a tolerance of only three quarters of 1%. And at the tunnel levels, and the tunnels were installed first, uh, they had only uh, four inches theoretical uh, clearance but yeah it, it was a very innovative solution for for the site conditions that that were presented here on the right you see uh, Stockton Street and how narrow that right-of-way that construction zone was um, and on the left you can see the uh, uh, rotator equipment that was used to install the uh, and extract the uh, the temporary uh, casing some pictures from inside and by the way i'd like to credit uh, and thank uh, david abrams in uh, wsp's new york office and ken johnson in san francisco for uh, sharing these photos but in the upper right you can see uh, uh, the the tangent piles and you can see the striations they're basically vertical which uh, is evidence that when they extracted the casing they just pulled it they didn't have to use the rotator for extracting the casing and you can see in in the lower right uh, the permanent uh, interior wall uh, here apparently the architects like the undulating surface of the uh, tangent piles but they they uh, wanted a, a smoother finish so they they kind of mimicked uh, the uh, the look of the walls with the cast in place concrete now here's here's something that's maybe less common in the united states with the use of steel sheet piles for a permanent uh, soe system uh, it seems to be more common in, in Europe, um, but in, in Miami, it seems to be uh, used for a number of structures for underground parking garages or, or uh, uh, building basements. And it's curious that it would be uh, uh, used down in Florida because in Miami, because there is a limestone layer that they have to drive the sheeting through, or in some cases, they uh, uh, pre-excavate a trench, backfill it with granule material, and then drive the sheeting through that. And uh, the sheeting, after it's installed and exposed, uh, the seams uh, are, are welded for water tightness, sandblasted uh, surface, and then uh, coated with uh, uh, paint uh, to provide corrosion resistance. So an innovative or different system that we don't often think about. So some final thoughts on the use of uh, permanent SOE walls. Uh, they're a very e economical option, and I think they should be considered for underground structures. Uh, even now, it's been, they've been around for a while, but even now there's some innovations, uh, found new applications for permanent SOE walls, uh, such as the wall in, in San Francisco. Uh, I, I think the use of permanent SOE systems requires greater attention desi to design details and construction procedures, and seepage needs to be better controlled to achieve more consistent performance. I think these last two points are very important to designers and owners to make sure that uh, the, the performance uh, is as intended. And the next uh, series of slides will talk about some of the design and construction considerations related to these walls. A general observation is that I think the design procedures are well established and, and, and proven to be generally successful. Uh, and recently, in recent decades, we now have numerical analyses that provide a valuable, a, a really powerful tool to de to analyze and design systems that would have been very difficult uh, to do uh, in years past, uh, unless you were uh, conservative. But it's it's it is a very powerful tool. It allows us to better understand soil structure interaction, uh, to assess the impact of different construction staging, and also to better uh, estimate ground and structure displacements. But I think there's still a, a role for, for traditional methods. In particular, the use of the tributary area method and with the apparent earth pressure diagram, uh, we, I think we still need to 
check that, uh, run through those calculations. Uh, this, these, this approach was originally developed by uh, Terzaghi and Peck on the Chicago subway system. I think it's, it's got a, a, a long period of successful and, 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 and proven use. It's typically conservative, um, and indirectly it reflects some of the uh, typical variations that occur during construction. Uh, during one lecture I had heard many years ago, uh, the speaker was saying that, well, numerical methods do a much better job of predicting uh, bracing loads uh, than the apparent earth pressure diagram. But I think uh, the speaker missed the point. It's, this method was not intended to try to predict the, the bracing loads, but to bracket or, or provide an envelope of maximum pressures that may occur due to different staging or uh, uh, diff different uh, sequencing of construction. And that's, that's the real benefit of it. I think today uh, with numerical methods, we, we get numbers from the computer for ground displacements, but we lo we've lost a feel for, you know, does it make sense? Uh, so I, I think using these kind of design charts, and here's a couple uh, that were uh, included in a paper by uh, Clough and O'Rourke in, in 1990, using uh, diagrams such as this, uh, give us a, a feel for you know what magnitude of displacements we should expect. Uh, so the, the plot on the left is for a, a, a soil settlement outside of the wall based on the depth of the excavation, and, and uh, he's got points for different types of walls. And on the right, uh, it's a plot of uh, lateral uh, wall movements, again, plotted versus depth for different points, uh, with different points representing different types of walls. This is a, a plot I, I've always liked. Um, it, it combines a, a number of elements or factors. It, it relates uh, displacement to the excavation depth and also to the, uh, the, the, the wall stif stiffness. So for slurry walls, as you get stiffer, you can see that displacements are less. Uh, but an added uh, use of this chart is that it brings our attention to um, uh, the factor of safety uh, uh, against basal heave. And this is a, a case where you might have uh, medium stiff clays near the bottom of the excavation. You, you have to make sure that you're not overstressing the ground. And, and this approach uh, helps you assess that because as, you, as your factor of safety decreases, you can see in the plot that, that the displacements rapidly increase. And basically, that factor of safety is just 5.1 divided by the stability number. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, in future slides. Uh, some of the design issues that, that need to be considered for slurry walls. Uh, first would be panel width. Typically, they're in the 10 to 25 foot range. Uh, and I would say that whenever you're adjacent to structures that are sensitive to displacements, you probably should be looking at 10 foot long panels or maybe even less. Uh, construction tolerances is, is something I think designers need to give uh, more attention to. Uh, a recent project um, the block, uh, had a problem with the block out panels. Um, they had a very tight tolerance on the location of those. The elevations were set within or less than a half inch. And when they exposed those uh, block outs during the uh, station excavation, uh, they were off by some distance because of racking of the cage or for other reasons. And it, be, it required a lot of rework in order to uh, make the connections of the slabs to that wall. So I think more realistic tolerances might have helped avoid those problems. Another issue is rebar spacing. Uh, one of the problems with uh, slurry walls is uh, defects uh, outside of the rebar cage. Uh, due to many reasons, but one contributing factor uh, might be that some of our rebars are too closely spaced and uh, inhibit the flow of concrete through the bars. I think some of the guidelines in the uh, FHWA drill shaft manual could, are directly applicable and, and should be uh, considered uh, when designing rebar for, uh, for slurry walls. And there uh, it's recommended that the uh, the clear spacing between bars should be not less than five times the uh, the size of the maximum size aggregate, or uh, preferably not less than five inches. And seepage, as I mentioned before, is one of the concerns with uh, uh, slurry walls. Um, 
uh, one recurring problem that we've seen on a number of projects is is the leaking uh, at the connection of the roof slab uh, to the to the uh, slurry wall itself. I think this is a could be the subject of a whole seminar by itself, uh, and we have to get engage uh, you know, structural engineers and materials engineers. But this is a problem that I think is fixable, but we just have to give more attention to those kind of details. Uh, in the end, with any uh, SOE, uh, permanent SOE uh, wall that doesn't have an interior uh, cast in place structure, we have to expect some amount of leaks and we have to design for those leaks. Uh, and part of that is to provide uh, access to those surfaces during the life of the structure so you can inspect them and, and maybe do some grouting to remediate any leaks. Uh, what's shown here is a cross section from the Baltimore Metro Shot Tower Station. Uh, and here down at track level, they had uh, a removable architectural panel uh, wall, uh, which could be removed for inspection of the slurry wall uh, and also remediation if needed. And at the bottom of that wall, there was a trough that would collect any seepage and, and, and lead it to the drainage system. So I think you know, to avoid unsightly stains or seepage into the structure, we have to think about controlling any seepage that may occur. Uh, some of the construction issues related to slurry wool, uh, in, in uh, recent years, the use of polymer slurry has become uh, very popular, and for good reasons. It's, it's a lot easier to clean the slurry. Uh, it's a lot easier to dispose of the slurry when, when you're done with it uh, than, than in comparison with uh, bentonite. Uh, however, we have to recognize that uh, there are many different polymer products out on the market, and they, they will uh, perform di somewhat differently up on the Boston Central Artery, which was ideal conditions, I think, for polymer slurry, because you had basically the Boston blue clay, which is a cohesive material. Uh, even there, they had to experiment with different polymers in order to get one that, that performed uh, uh, acceptably. Uh, polymers may not be suited uh, to uh, systems uh, that have mechanical agitation, such as hydromills, because the hydromill breaks up uh, the, the fibers, the polymer fibers, uh, and, and thereby it reduces its uh, beneficial effect. And I would say I, would, yeah, I, I really uh, would not recommend using polymer slurry when you have coarse grained soils. Um, bentonite works much better. It has a higher unit weight and it forms a filter cake on the sides of the of trench uh, to stabilize the hole. On the uh, uh, Second Avenue subway, they had one section that was of, of slurry walls that were installed using uh, uh, a polymer slurry. And uh, they had over that section a, an average concrete overrun of 20% indic indicating you know, collapse or instability of, of the trench. And they also had um, a surface settlement outside of the slurry wall uh, as much as three inches. And when they excavated the station, they, they had a lot of chipping to do to, to cut back that excess concrete to the design line. So, I, I would caution uh, using uh, uh, polymer slurry uh, when you have granule materials, uh, and, and actually uh, would recommend using bentonite slurry for such cases. Cleaning uh, is extremely important with slurry walls, you know, bottom cleaning and also uh, cleaning the slurry before you start concrete placement, because any sediments that are left either sitting on the bottom, well, if it's left on the bottom, then you don't have as a tight a contact and you might have excess or uh, uh, increased seepage uh, from the bottom. But you, there's also the risk that that sediment and the sediment that's in the slurry could be trapped within the, uh, the wall panel and, and uh, form uh, a source of seepage. In the uh, photo at left, there's a not uncommon problem at the joints where some of that sediment accumulates and, and creates some amount of defect that has to be remediated. Lower right, uh, this is from the Baltimore Metro. We had a, a problem where this uh, below, immediately below the knockout panel, uh, was, it was a, an area where uh, debris was trapped and accumulated and caused a large defect in some of the panels. Uh, the photo on the upper right is uh, was caused by uh, something different. It was, uh, a piece of styrofoam had broken off and got lodged where it wasn't supposed to and created a big void. So in those two cases, the, those, the patching there uh, required a, a concrete, uh, cast-in-place concrete uh, uh, block to, to fill that space. 
uh, but typically the joints or uh, leaks are, are uh, sealed off with grouting. Uh, concrete mix is also important for slurry walls. Typically, uh, and it would be recommended that uh, concrete be provided with a slump of seven to nine inches. And, and equally important, uh, it has to maintain a certain minimum slump, typically four inches during the duration of the concrete placement. Uh, and also, uh, aggregate size uh, should be uh, limited. Uh, I've seen some cases where uh, aggregate one inch to one and a half inch was, was uh, used, but that just increases the the risk of uh, problems in the flow of concrete through the rebar cage. So it's it's be better to go with a smaller size aggregate, especially if you had a large concentration of rebar. And we would recommend no more than uh, three quarter inch. Now. There's a technology with, uh, being uh, rapidly adopted with drilled shafts, and that's the use of self-consolidating concrete. And here, the, the, the concrete is so fluid that you can't even measure a slump. It's, it's meaningless. So they, they measure or they do the QC measurements uh, by determining the spread of the concrete. And typically, you're looking for a spread of at least 18 inches after you lift the cone. I think th it, this is promising for slurry walls. I think this... Um, uh, this this promises to reduce some of the defects that we see in the uh, uh, the trapping of uh, 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 contaminants or or poor concrete outside of the rebar cage. So I'd like to see some examples of that in the future. I think it should go a long way to solving some of those problems. With concrete placement, uh, the number of tremi uh, pipes uh, should be considered. Um, I think if you have a long panel, one, one pipe is just not enough because the further the concrete has to flow laterally, the more debris it accumulates, and then the, wherever those, that debris is trapped, there's a greater concentration of, of uh, debris. So uh, I would, su I would uh, suggest that any panels greater than uh, certainly 16 feet, if not you know, 12 or 14 feet, should have uh, at least two tremie pipes. Now, if you have multiple tremies, tremies, you have to coordinate the concrete placement in those tremies. You, the concrete has to rise uniformly, otherwise uh, you risk trapping latents in, in some of the concrete if the concrete from one tremie starts pouring over the, the, the concrete from the other. And with any uh, tremie operation, it's essential that the tremie be maintain a minimum embedment into the concrete. It should be at least five feet. And of course, you have to avoid interruptions to the concrete pour because as, as, as the pour is interrupted, the concrete starts setting, it's not as flowable, and it, it's likely that you're gonna get uh, cold joints or defects in the, in the panel. And some of the uh, construction issues related to secant and tangent pile walls. Uh, number one is that you have to maintain proper pile position and alignment. We that's essential in order to minimize the risk of uh, gaps between the piles that may be a source of uh, ground loss or, or seepage. And many of the other uh, bullets here, all the other bullets here, uh, are, are essentially the same as what you would encounter or have with a drilled shaft uh, construction. You should be using temporary casing and granular soils. You have to maintain the fluid level within the hole during drilling so you don't get uh, seepage and loosening of the material under the uh, casing. Uh, you have to clean the drilling fluid prior to concrete placement, again, to avoid contamination of the concrete. Uh, and you have to provide sufficient rebar spacing, as I mentioned before, and, and uh, have to have proper concrete mix and placement methods. And I would suggest uh, referring to, the, the again, the FHWA drill shaft manual for what I think is best practices for uh, board pile construction. Some final thoughts on design and construction. Uh, again, design methods, I think, are well-established and generally successful. Numerical analysis provides a powerful tool, especially for estimating uh, ground and structure displacements. But there's still a, a role for uh, traditional design methods and empirical data. And I think it, 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 it's uh, very useful to refer back to that to make to, as a sanity check and, and as a check of the more complex result. Uh, uh, the data that we get from the more complex analysis. 
I think construction means and methods need to be suited to uh, ground conditions. Uh, we, you know, one type of method uh, uh, construction doesn't uh, 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 may not work in all ground conditions. And better construction practices can improve the performance of these structures. And I think it is essential that we do continuously improve uh, the, uh, our construction practices because, again, if uh, we, we want our owners and we want our engineers to be comfortable with selecting uh, uh, permanent SOE systems, we have to uh, assure long-term performance. And that leads to the next uh, part of the presentation, and, and that's a discussion and some thoughts on the performance of SOE systems. I think uh, the performance is generally good, but some problems still occur. Uh, fortunately, we don't have catastrophic uh, failures very often. Uh, here's an example of one back from in 2004 in Singapore. Um, cut and cover construction with slurry walls uh, that completely collapsed. And the, uh, the forensic studies uh, found uh, a basic problem, and it was a design problem on this project. The designer used the drain strengths for the uh, adjacent soil, even though the, the, those soils consisted of 25 meters of soft clay. If they had used the undrained strength, they would have found that the lateral loads were significantly greater than what they uh, estimated with the drain strength. And uh, complicating the problem or adding to the problem was that uh, there was inadequate stiffeners for the whalers and there were some field changes uh, to the strut whale connection, which made things even worse. So this, was, this is, I think, is a, uh, a, a problem with design and, and to some extent, uh, added to by uh, the construction changes. Here's a, a failure of a tieback wall in uh, Istanbul uh, fairly recently. The photo on the left shows the wall just before failure and uh, the one on the right shows the wall in the process of just total collapse. It's obvious that uh, here either uh, the design earth pressures were too small or the anchors were not properly designed or maybe there was some uh, uh, problems with the installation and, and the, the uh, achieving the capacity of those anchors. I haven't seen a report of, of this particular failure, but just I'm showing this just to illustrate that you know, such catastrophic failures uh, can occur, but fortunately uh, they're not too common. This is a different type of uh, a problem, different type of structure. This is a, a sinking caisson uh, that was used uh, for a water treatment uh, plant uh, or shaft in southern uh, Michigan. Uh, and this, uh, in the, this uh, facility was constructed by casting rings at the ground surface and then adding rings sequentially as the structure sank into the ground. And here, this particular photo shows a uh, shaft that's 70 foot uh, in diameter and has four and a half foot thick walls. And it had to be sunk through about 40 feet of uh, soft cohesive soils. Now, if they had excavated, uh, fully excavated the inside of, of uh, uh, the caisson, uh, they would have had instability of the base, but the designers anticipated that and designed it uh, during construction with a soil plug to maintain that stability. However, during construction, when the caisson was being sunk, uh, it, it ran into some obstructions. Uh, and it forced the contractor to remove the plug on the inside of the of the uh, caisson uh, to expose and remove those obstructions. But by so doing, they removed the plug, they removed the interior uh, overburden uh, pressure, um, and that uh, caused, uh, uh, you know, as you see here, and this is, we often heard about uh, uh, clay squeezing like toothpaste. This is one case where it, it was actually observed. Uh, the, the soft clays were so uh, stressed that they just squeezed into the caisson, uh, resulting in large displacement and settlement outside of the caisson and tilting and structural damage of the caisson. And it's curious that, again, the stability number, a very simple calculation uh, should have uh, warned that this was going to happen. And the stability number here, the equation here is just a very simple thing. It's the external overburden pressure plus any uh, external surcharge pressure minus uh, the weight of the uh, the plug within the caisson divided by the shear strength of the soil. Very simple calculation. And I would 
uh, and I've always recommended that on any project, whether it's retaining wall, uh, uh, slope, uh, or caissons such as this, run that simple calculation. That'll, that should give you a good idea if you have a problem or if everything is fine. Uh, again, fortunately, we don't have too many catastrophic failures, but more uh, common types of problems are related to ground loss and settlement, uh, and, and there's a whole host of causes for these things. Uh, I think everyone on the call is probably familiar with these, uh, but there's uh, possibly one uh, cause that, that isn't often recognized, and that would be ground loss due to the uh, wall installation itself. As I said before, oftentimes we, we select a stiff wall system. We feel that's a mitigation against ground and structure movements. But sometimes uh, we can have significant uh, displacements due to the installation process itself. We can't just wish those walls into place. And here's an example of a fan shaft that uh, was supported by secant pile walls. Uh, the secant piles, a 39 inch diameter, and they were, uh, uh, the excavation was about 30 feet deep. Uh, and the system was used to support a masonry structure that was adjacent to the, uh, to the excavation. Um, the structure was founded on shallow foundations and underlined by uh, uh, fill, sand, and, and silts. And it had a high groundwater table. And here we can see um, that a large portion, a large amount of settlement occurred during the installation of the secant piles, about one and a half inches, which far exceeded the specified limit of 0.6 inches. And I think part of this was due to the difficult, difficult ground conditions, but inspection records uh, also indicated that there were some problems with the installation of the piles. Uh, sometimes they didn't maintain a sufficient plug within the casing, and sometimes uh, actually they drilled below the casing. Uh, sometimes they let the, uh, often I should say, they left, let the water level within the uh, casing drop below the ground water level. And I think all of these contributed to ground loss into the casing and therefore settlement outside of the casing. Uh, I think on many projects we, we try to uh, apply the observational method um, and certainly in more difficult projects uh, it's essential that we uh, use this method, uh, a method developed by or uh, proposed by uh, Ralph Peck many years ago. And this requires or a set requires several steps. One, you have to predict the performance uh, of, of, of the structure. Uh, you have to estimate threshold values, what would be acceptable uh, amounts of movement. You have to monitor the performance to see how much movement the, that, that you actually get. Um, and I think we all do a good job on those first three bullets, but I think sometimes we miss the next few bullets, which is an essential part of the observational method, and that is to define contingency measures and to have these measures uh, available when needed or if needed during construction. Uh, not too long ago, I saw a, a submittal that said, well, you know, we're going to protect the building from, from settlement because we're doing uh, instrumentation monitoring. Uh, that's not correct. You do the instrumentation monitoring to give you the information, but you have to have a contingency, a practical contingency plan ready uh, to implement. One project uh, uh, Aaron had mentioned, the Eurasia Tunnel uh, that I worked on, I think this is a good example of a good application of the observational approach. And here I'd like to talk about the, the Asian transition box, which is on the right-hand side of the photo. And it's from this shaft, this was the launch shaft for the TBM that went underneath the Bosphorus from uh, east to west. And, uh, and on the other end of that uh, box, uh, two uh, NATM tunnels were launched. So it was a critical element of the project. And the shaft was 100 and about 174 meters long and uh, with a depth of up to 38 uh, meters. It was entirely in rock, uh, of the, what they call the trachea formation, which is a very heterogeneous mix of uh, silt stones, clay stones, and sandstones, uh, high, very variable uh, rock quality uh, due to tectonic activities uh, in this area. And uh, the upper right shows uh, a photo of some of the rock core. You can see it is extremely poor. And uh, on the bottom is a 
a graphic rep, uh, representation of, of the quality of the rock uh, on, along one side of the excavation. And just by the color coding, I'm not getting into the details, but you can see how highly variable the quality of the rock was. So it, it was impossible to come up with an idealized profile uh, or design parameters. For this project, the designers looked at other excavation experience in Istanbul and looked at the literature and came up with what they felt was reasonably conservative uh, parameters. Contractor thought that they were too conservative and brought in his own consultant who was, had more optimistic uh, ideas of the parameters. In the end, to move the project along, it was a compromise on the parameters, but it was decided to place a lot of emphasis on uh, monitoring and also to have the contingency plan available. Uh, the displacements were estimated using Plaxus and, and the maximum wall displacements uh, were estimated to be about 15 millimeters, not very much. Uh, by the way, in the cross section, the upper portion is a secant pile wall. Uh, that continuous wall was selected because that's where we expected the greatest uh, seepage or the groundwater uh, problem. And below that uh, was individual board piles. Uh, 8.8 uh, .8 meters spaced one meter apart. Now, during construction, they were down about uh, 12 meters, about one third of the total depth of the excavation. And they experienced displacements and they jumped overnight up to about 35 millimeters, which is uh, twice what was estimated for the uh, displacement for the full depth of excavation. So at that point, the contingency plan uh, kicked in uh, contractor partially backfilled uh, the excavation by putting in berms to stabilize uh, the sidewalls. Uh, the engineers uh, uh, analyzed the, the data, back calculated uh, parameters for, for the rock, uh, and then used those parameters to uh, reevaluate the support system. Uh, with, uh, and, and, and it resulted in two or three level, additional levels of tieback anchors. And after implementing that, the excavation uh, was completed without further uh, issues. And uh, that, as of today, it's, it's all backfilled and, and the uh, roadway is in, in, in operation. Some final thoughts. Again, major failures uh, fortunately are rare, but displacement problems persist. There's a need for greater attention to construction means and methods and construction inspection uh, to, to do a, a better job in constructing uh, our SOE systems. And instrumentation monitoring and timely response to issues are key to the successful project. Uh, now, last portion of the presentation, I'll uh, talk about uh, the design for buoyancy of permanent uh, structures, underground structures. And today there's uh, you know, three strategies, either provide sufficient dead weight of the structure and overburden to resist the buoyancy, or to provide a permanent pressure relief system under the structure to relieve uh, the uplift pressures, or uh, install a permanent tie down system to uh, make the invert slab uh, sufficiently resistant to those uplift pressures. Uh, the uh, using dead weight is a traditional approach. It's the most reliable method, uh, but it also may require some temporary pressure relief system during construction until the, the box is, has enough weight or, or the uh, and the overburden is sufficiently high enough that the weight can by itself resist the uplift pressure. Permanent pressure relief system has been used. We we, uh, we had used it up in Boston for the post office square garage. Here there was a above ground unsightly parking garage that was replaced with a seven level underground parking garage. Um, if we had to design, uh, you know, or provide sufficient dead weight to resist the uplift force, we there's no way they could have had seven levels of uh, parking. But Fortunately, uh, in Boston, with the Boston blue clay and, and with the slurry walls, the perimeter slurry walls being uh, extended into the underlying arch light, the seepage uh, beneath to the to the area beneath the inverse slab was uh, was low and controllable. So it was decided to go with a permanent pressure relief system. But you know these conditions were ideal for for that uh, application. Uh, and I, I, I'm not quite sure that we'll, we'll see that in too many different locations, but here it worked very well. In fact, in recent years, the system was converted to use that whatever water was extracted 
to, to clean the garage uh, and therefore limit or reduce the amount of city water that would have to be used for the facility. Uh, the third method is a you know, tie-down system. Um, there's limited uh, track record or experience with uh, using the, uh, such tie-downs in uh, transportation uh, structures. Uh, there's a project in Pittsburgh uh, where it's been used, and there's a few examples in Europe. But importantly, they're all less than about 15 years old, so there's not too much of a track record on the long-term experience with uh, permanent tie-down systems. Now, they are used in uh, some concrete dam retrofits, but regulations require that they're accessible and, and in, they can be inspected and tested if need be. Uh, that's kind of an uh, uh, you know, inspection that we don't uh, see in transportation uh, structures. They're also used sometimes in uh, you know, uh, for water facilities, such as shafts and pumping stations, uh, but they're often only called into uh, play when, when they have to uh, unwater those uh, structures, uh, and so that doesn't occur too often. And if there were some uh, damaging seepage or uplift of the slab, it's not a, a major problem as it would be for a transportation structure. And what are the some of the common types of tie-down elements? Well, we have drill shafts, barrettes, which are basically just individual slurry wall elements that are can be used for compression or tension loads. Uh, uh, use of mini piles and also uh, soil and rock anchors. Some of the design issues that have to be considered uh, for transportation structures, underground structures, uh, typically it's 100 years or if not more. I mean, look at New York City subway system is still operating and it's more than uh, well above 100 years. Uh, we have to think about load transfer. If, uh, if we have untensioned elements, uh, those elements will experience elastic elongation as the load, uh, the water pressure comes onto the invert slab. So we have to estimate how much displacement that may cause. Of course, corrosion is fundamental. We have to consider that, particularly, uh, well, for the entire length of the anchor and especially at the connection at, at the top of the anchor. In some cases, uh, uh, we have to worry about a creep, uh, depending on the soil or the ground that the anchors are uh, anchored in. And we have to think about monitoring and inspection during uh, the service life of the structure. And unfortunately, uh, many of our transportation facilities, uh, that's not uh, you know, reliably done. Now, here's an example where we uh, actually designed a, a tie-down system for uh, a subway station in Baltimore for the red line. I have to say at the beginning here that we fully designed it, uh, it was ready to go, but uh, because of funding and other considerations, it, it was not built. And uh, I'm not quite sure when or if it will be built, but in any event, it, it's, it still serves as a good case history of, of a, a permanent tie down, tie down system for an underground structure. And here we were forced to consider that because we had a very narrow right of way, uh, but the box had to be had to have a certain had had a certain dimensions, um, so that and there was also a high water level, groundwater level as well as a flood level that was above uh, street level, so high buoyancy forces. So looking at all those factors, it was not possible to to provide a sufficient dead weight, uh, and we didn't think that uh, long term it was practical to have a, a permanent pressure relief system underneath the invert slab. But fortunately, uh, rock was at a shallow depth below uh, the station, and we took advantage of that in the design. So some of our recommendations for uh, uh, the red line was we, we limited the side resistance that we uh, could count on from the uh, slurry walls because we were concerned that the, the slurry uh, uh, filter cake that builds up on the side walls would reduce that friction. So we were conservative in, in, in estimating that resistance. And we ended up using pre-stressed rock anchors uh, tied down in, uh, into the uh, good quality rock under the station. Uh, anchors were provided with double corrosion protectors with uh, uh, focus on the details of the anchor head to, to uh, reduce the risk of uh, corrosion at that location. Uh, for a 100-year life, we, we reduced the ashto resistance factor from 0.5 to 0.4 to, to get greater reliability. Um, and we provided additional anchors for redundancy just in case some of the anchors failed. I think we ended up 
adding about uh, 10% anchors to what we theoretically needed. And there was a requirement uh, during construction, during installation to test all of those anchors. Um, so final thoughts on buoyancy and design for buoyancy. I, I highly recommend resisting buoyancy with dead weight whenever possible. Uh, consider permanent pressure relief system only if uh, ground conditions are, are suitable. And if tie downs are unavoidable, uh, design conservatively. So you know, to sum up the presentation, just a few key points. Uh, to reiter reiterate, the design methods for SOE are, I think, well established and generally successful. Uh, I think in the future, design needs to focus more on the details, constructability, and construction specifications. Uh, the performance of SOE systems is generally good, but problems persist, especially with ground displacements and seepage, and I think those need to be addressed. Um, performance issues are often related to the means and methods of construction and the care taken during construction. And I, I think there's always uh, room for improvement there. Um, and instrumentation monitoring and, and timely response to problems are key to a successful performance. And that concludes my presentation. I, I thank you very much uh, for, for, for your hour of time. And I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ray. Um, I'll read off the questions as we receive them. If you have any questions, please submit them on the right side of your screen in the questions box. Uh, the first question we have is in the in the picture of the permanent slurry wall uh, supportive excavation at the Trade Center. Uh, was that the original Trade Center or the new Trade Center construction? I believe it was the uh, the original. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the case because they also had the foundations exposed, but I don't have, uh, you know, I can't say for, for certain on that. Um, the next question is, what are the typical maximums for secant pile walls and slurry walls? What is the deepest installation of each that you've seen in your experience? I think uh, 80 feet uh, would be a typical maximum, although the, uh, the tangent piles in San Francisco, they were over 100 feet. Uh, deep, so it's achievable, and, and there they had very tight tolerances on installation, so it is achievable, but of course it it requires uh, specialized equipment. Uh, they were monitoring those as they were going down uh, with regard to inclination uh, and position, uh, but it is achievable. So I think uh, you know, over 100 feet is is possible, but uh, recommended to stay uh, within 80 feet if you can. Okay, uh, next question is, what are the options to solve buoyancy issues if you don't want to go with tie-down anchors and permanent pressure relief systems, if those two options aren't feasible? Uh, it doesn't leave you too many options. I think uh, pretty much the dead weight uh, option is, is required. So then uh, uh, the feasibility of that has to be investigated. Usually you wouldn't even consider the other two unless uh, you didn't, you weren't able to provide dead weight. But, you could uh, look into ways of increasing the dead weight by uh, you know, putting uh, a wider section uh, to engage more, a wider section up top where, where you have, we don't have void space, but you can engage more uh, dead weight of the material above the, uh, of the roof of the structure. Um, no, that's, uh, I, I think if in that kind of scenario that uh, it's, it's like, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what you would have have to do. It looks like that would be a situation where you have to go to tie down if you if you can't provide dead weight and you, and uh, permanent pressure relief is not feasible or desirable. The next question is in the pressure diagram sketch for traditional design, the passive resistance is shown as beginning at design grade. Should it be lowered to account for future excavation in front of the wall? And I believe the question is referring to the design sketch showing the tributary area method with the apparent earth pressure diagram. Right, right. Well, that would be for an underground structure, so you wouldn't expect any future excavation below the invert. In fact, some might say that the, you know, the presence of the, uh, the invert uh, slab provides some 
uh, some way. I, I, I should I should correct myself. I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So would this be during construction? If it's during construction, then it has nothing to do with the, the final structure. If it's during construction, I agree, yes, they should consider uh, possible over-excavation. Typically, it's, we assume one to two feet of over-excavation. Sometimes that becomes necessary to remove you know, poor material or to put down a, a gravel uh, uh, bed for, to start you know, your, 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 uh, your concrete uh, placement on. I, was that the question, Aaron? Yes. Uh, construction? Uh, yes, okay. yes, yes. Uh, then the next question is for the pressure relief system. How is the pump system sized? Was a flow net developed to estimate the amount of water flowing under the wall or some other method? Yeah, I believe it was a flow net uh, method and we had to look at a, a range and permeabilities of the different materials. Uh, and we had to convince ourselves that the, the seepage was low. Uh, it's been a while. I, I think that everything was proven uh, to be okay on that project. Uh, we didn't have any uh, excessive uh, seepage, but I, the site conditions there were very favorable, as I said, with the Boston blue clay and, and the argillite rock, uh, uh, very low permeability materials. I, I might uh, go back to the uh, Baltimore Metro shot tower station. There we did do seepage analysis to try to estimate not only the amount of seepage that may come in under the slurry walls there, but also the amount of uh, groundwater lowering on the outside of the uh, slurry walls. Uh, so yeah, we did, and we also relied on that analysis to reduce the water pressure on the lowest portion of the slurry wall, because if we use the full hydrostatic pressure, uh, you know, the reinforcement uh, requirements would have been tremendously greater. So we took advantage of the internal pumping to to relieve some of that water pressure, so uh, so I think that that's uh, you know a valid approach. Okay. Uh, the next question is the uh, next question is what makes the engineer uh, use drained uh, soil properties uh, instead of undrained soil properties? Uh, and I believe they're referring to the um, to the failure that you, that, that you were discussing right. with, uh, right. with the thick the clay. I think it might be good to check both uh, cases uh, if there's any question to see which one governs. In that particular case, I, I was very surprised that uh, they assumed drain conditions for for you know 25 meters of soft clay. Uh, it would take. Uh, so so long it would be construction would be long gone before you reach the drain condition for those soils. So in, in a case like that, I think it's obvious that it was uh, appropriate to use undrained. But if there's any question, then it should be checked both ways. In the original uh, slurry walls uh, for the uh, BART system in San Francisco, um, they just assumed there was a hydrostatic pressure on on those for the design of the slurry walls because the clays were uh, uh, were so soft uh, that it was basically just a heavy fluid. So even on that project, uh, even the apparent earth pressure diagrams might have underpredicted the uh, lateral pressure you know, at the deeper sections of the wall. So I, I guess a lot of judgment has to go into it, but you know, certainly if you have soft to medium clays, you have to uh, consider the undrained case. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Um, the next question is, uh, what other ground conditions are suitable for the permanent pressure relief system other than uh, the case you mentioned in Boston? I think what's key is uh, how much seepage that you might get under that invert slab and what kind of long-term pumping requirements, because there's a cost to pumping. So what, what long-term pumping cost and maintenance cost uh, would that entail? Now, certainly, even if you had granular material, if you had slurry walls that you could extend deep enough in, into uh, a low permeability material, you might uh, be able to reduce that seepage sufficiently so that that way it would become practical uh, for a long-term pumping system. But uh, but you have to be careful because if you 
under predict the amount of seepage that could become a you know very costly long term operational cost to maintain that system. Okay. Uh, and I think we'll take two more questions. The next question, uh, did the support of excavation to tangent piles uh, extend beyond the property line in San Francisco, in the San Francisco example, at a very deep level? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, that was a question I had, actually. Uh, but apparently, it only extended uh, uh, beyond the or into the property uh, when it was below the permanent uh, uh, station structure. And so... Theoretically, that portion was not lead, needed for long-term lateral support. And theoretically, you know, if the, if the owner of that building of that property wanted to use that space uh, and he could somehow remove those piles, he's free to do so because uh, that was pretty much just a construction easement. You know, but practically, yeah, the, I, I can't imagine anybody trying to do that. But yes, they, they did extend uh, outside of the right-of-way. And, and and by the way, uh, I understand that uh, it was a tight tolerance, three quarters uh, of a percent on the uh, inclination, and they achieved that on, on about two thirds of the piles that were installed. One third exceeded it, but they but even those piles didn't encroach upon the uh, the minimum dimensions of the of the station at that location. So I think that was a it was a great example of a good good construction practice. Thank you, Ray. And we'll take a final question. Uh, in your experience with slurry walls with tiebacks, was the predicted wall deflection using the finite element method, for example, consistently more than the measured wall deflection, assuming that construction was done pretty much as the designer intended? I, I think it's 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 my uh, recollection. I think they're they've been pretty good uh, predictions uh, using. Uh, finite element analysis, um, and of course, I, I've always found that whatever pressures you design for, that that kind of dictates the uh, the amount of bracing or tieback force that you apply, uh, and so it's like self compensating. If you're more conservative, you get bigger loads, but uh, uh, and less displacement. So, but I, I think there's been a uh, a good correlation. I, I don't think that uh, one could I could say that one method has underestimated or overestimated the displacements. Uh, I think uh, what's more what what's more uh, sensitive to the results is what you assume for your parameters, like the case in uh, for the Eurasia tunnel, because there the parameters uh, I won't say it was anybody's guess, but you know it's very difficult to predict. Uh, so what you put into your uh, model, your Plaxus model or what have you, uh, the results that you get is only related to that, but it may, may not reflect the true conditions. Uh, so that's the difficult part. It's not the method of analysis, but it's the parameters that you input into that analysis. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Is the last question we'll take and uh, as i mentioned the webinar will be recorded and sent to all registrants uh, after the lecture and we'll wrap up the webinar now thank you